Dr. Phil Ward is somebody who has given decades of his life in service to our profession. He's done a ton for every single one of us in this room. He served his state uh, on the North Carolina board, moving through all the positions, including presidency, and then went on to the APMA Board of Trustees, where he held every position uh, up to president and is now a past president of the APMA. He's on the coding committee. He continues to serve as the um, APMA representative to CPT. He's somebody I have learned a tremendous amount from myself. So please welcome Dr. Phil Ward. Thank you, Jeff. I think you just meant that I'm old, that's all. Uh, it, it is a pleasure to be here. I do have one disclaimer. I am, uh, as Jeff is, one of the experts on coding line. Uh, so that is the only disclaimer I have for this talk. Um, one thing I like to start off with is one of my favorite quotes. It was from Einstein. Einstein used to say, there's no use memorizing things that are easily looked up. So if you ask me a specific question about a specific code, I'm going to point you back to the references because I don't keep those in my head. There's no reason to. Einstein never knew his address because the towns that he lived in during his life, everybody knew who he was. They all knew where he lived. They took him home. Uh, so he never, never knew those things. Uh, the reference materials I'm talking about, we've already mentioned the Coding Resource Center. Uh, APMA seminars, the live ones like this, as well as the webinars that are taped. Uh, they're done live. I did one two weeks ago. They're done live and then they're recorded. So at any time you can go back, look at those. I did one on metatarsal surgery two weeks ago. Uh, Jeff did one on, I think Jeff did the one on bunions. Uh, I did one on digital surgery back in December. So you can go back to the references and look at all those uh, and go back and, and look at those at any time. They're all about 45 minutes to an hour long. Uh, and then APMA website has lots of references on there. We have a downloadable, uh, that wasn't a word when I was a kid. Downloadable, it wasn't a word. Uh, you have downloadable booklets, pamphlets, there's a DME booklet, there's lots of different things that are uh, in PDFs that you can download and print out if you want. Uh, coding basics, uh, why do we use codes? And then this is designed to be a basic one. I see some people in the audience with uh, a little more gray hair than I have and not quite as much as I have. Uh, or some, in some instances, none. Uh, but uh, this is more of a basic uh, coding lecture. Uh, so we use codes to tell the insurance companies what we did and why we did it, and anything special about what we did and why we did it. Uh, so we use the codes. We have CPT, the ICD-10, and uh, HICSBIX codes. CPT stands for Current Procedural Terminology. I am the CPT advisor for APMA, so I'm at the CPT meetings. We meet three times a year to develop new codes, refine old codes, change terminologies, things like that. Uh, keep in mind the AMA owns CPT, so they have a vested interest in CPT. So anytime you buy uh, a CPT book, a AMA is getting a royalty on it. Uh, category 1 codes are the codes we typically use. Those are like the, the Bunyan codes, the 2829 series of codes. Uh, category 3 codes are experimental uh, and investigational codes. So if you, if you do uh, a subtitle joint arthresis procedure, uh, that's a C, uh, Category 3 code. Codes are, are added, deleted, updated three times a year. They become effective on January 1st. So the book that you, you get or an APMA Coding Resource Center, if you look at that, it's updated. So it's good to go on January 1st with all the new codes that are in it. Uh, category 1 codes are always numeric. Category 3 codes are alphanumeric. And HICSPIX, a healthcare common procedural coding system, are alphanumeric codes too. And those are the, we'll talk about those a little bit later. Uh, they're the codes that have uh, the DME aspects, uh, skin substitute, products, uh, things along those lines are in the uh, HICSPIX codes. Uh, ICD-10 is the 10th edition of the International Classification of Diseases. The first one was in like 1880, uh, and we're now in the 10th edition. 11 is being used in other parts of the world. When we were introducing ICD-10 at a CPT meeting about eight or nine years ago, uh, a God bless his soul, Harry Goldsmith got up at the meeting and said, the rest of the world's going to ICD-11. Why don't we go to ICD-11 from ICD-9? And the answer from the head of CMS was, well, we can't count 9, 11. We have to go to 10. 
That was the answer. Uh, but when we do go to 11 eventually, uh, it, uh, it's not that much different than 10. So no, but not the massive change we had from 9 to 10. It's not that much difference from 10 to 11. Uh, the, not who owns ICD, the World Health Organization owns ICD. AMA does not own it, but in the United States, CDC is the organization that oversees ICD in the United States. Uh, ICD-10 codes are alphanumeric, and we'll talk about the structure of those codes. We won't go through co specific codes, but we'll talk about how the structure is and help you understand how detailed you have to be. Uh, on the structure, the first three characters uh, describe the body system, what you're looking at. So the first character is, is always going to be a letter, so A through Z. Second character is always going to be a number. Third character is always going to be a number. Then there's a period. Okay, so it's, it would be like um, B72 point something. So the example I'm using is, is uh, just a general pain. M79 is the ICD diagnosis for pain. I haven't really told you anything. I've just said we've got pain somewhere. Okay, so we have to go further. So you have to go to the fourth character. It defines the site, etiology, manifestation, or state of the disease or condition. It's always numeric. So the fourth code, M79.6. So we've said we've got pain in a limb, hand, foot, fingers, or toes. Okay, so we've eliminated the, the head and the central part of the body. So we're, we're isolating it down to where, the, where it is. If we go to the fifth character, it becomes more specific. And we said we've M79.60, uh, pain in limb. Well, now I've gone from the entire body to one of four places. So we still haven't said where exactly we're talking about. I've got the, the, a, a limb somewhere. And if you go to the, to the next character, uh, to the sixth character, we've said M79.601, I've got pain in the right arm. Okay. O3 would be pain in the right leg. Okay. So you're getting more specific with each one. Uh, there's some caveats to it. There's some so-called character extensions. These are typically letters, not always, but usually letters, and they're typically in the seventh place, in the seventh character. Uh, they're non-fracture character codes. If you've got injuries or something like that, you would go to a seventh character that says, this is initial time I've seen the person for this injury. Maybe it was a laceration. First time I've seen this patient for this in injury. Subsequent encounter, and then the last one is the sequelae. Uh, so if you've got uh, somebody that's got a, a laceration and, and it's all treated and they come back two years later and they've got nerve damage from that laceration, that's a sequelae from the laceration in addition to the nerve damage code. There are also fracture care codes, and these are the ones that we'll specifically use more frequently. Uh, if a patient comes in with a fifth metatarsal fracture, you can use the diagnosis as fifth metatarsal fracture, and then for the seventh character, it's the first time you've seen it for this, so it's going to be A on the initial character. So that seventh character will be an A. And you have to carry it out to that seventh character, or else the insurance company is going to deny the claim. Uh, if it's an open fracture, that first character would, that seventh character would be a B. It's a difference between closed and open. Uh, subsequent encounter for a normal healing fracture, you're seeing the patient, everything's going fine. This is the third or fourth follow-up that you're seeing the patient, and everything's healing fine. Your diagnosis code changes from that A to D, saying everything's healing fine. Or if they're not healing fine, it would go to delayed healing, non-union, malunion, one of those. Rarely we're going to use the S, the sequelae, for this one, uh, because uh, typically you're just not going to, going to see those down the road. Uh, so you don't really have to worry about the S. So the ones you're typically going to use are either A, D, uh, B, or D, if everything's healing well. So if you're going to go back in the patient's got that fifth met fracture and it's just not healing, three months down the road, you're going to go back, uh, take them in the operating room and do an uh, ORIF on that fifth met fracture, then you're going to change to non-healing or delayed healing or non-union or malunion, something like that. Uh, seventh care example, lacerated right ulnar artery. That's just an example of how to go out to the seventh character. Okay, so questions with the structure of ICD. Again, we're not going to talk about specific ICD codes. They're, they're in the books. You can find them. But that's how you structure. That's how you look for the structure and how far you have to go. If you see on the Coding Resource Center, if you see a code that has a hyphen after it, an ICD-10 code that has a hyphen after it, that means you're not done. You have to go to the next space. If there's a hyphen there, you have to go to the next one. 
So frequently it'd have to go all the way out to seven, but not always do we have to go to seven characters. If you think about onychomycosis, that's only a three-digit character. Uh, on CPT codes, we're going to talk about some specific CPT codes. E&M codes, we're going to have a full lecture uh, after lunch on E&M codes. So I'm not going to go into detail now, uh, but uh, you remember that E&M codes have different codes for different place of service. If I use POS today, I'm talking about place of service, not some other uh, abbreviation for POS. So E&M codes we'll talk about a little later, and, and uh, I think Jeff and I are going to do a dog and pony show on that one. Uh, common nail codes, the typ typical ones that we're going to use for most patients, 11719, GO127. What's the difference in payment between 11719 and GO127? There is no difference in payment. What's the difference in the code? 11719 is you trimmed a normal nail. GO127 says I trimmed a dystrophic nail. What's the difference between a dystrophic and a mycotic nail? Clinically, you can potentially make a difference, but laboratory-wise, there's a difference between a dystrophic and a mycotic nail. Uh, what's the difference between trimming and debriding? Debriding is reducing thickness. Trimming is reducing length. You can't trim and debride the same nail. Pick one. Okay. Uh, so 11720, and there's no number of nails on 11719 or GO127. It says, I'm doing nails. So you're getting paid for all 10. Uh, 11720 says, I'm debriding at least one nail up to five nails. And these are going to be typically pathological nails. All right, so generally, they're going to be mycotic nails, typically, is what you're looking at. So I'm debriding thickened dystrophic mycotic nails, reducing the bulk, reducing thickness. Uh, 11721 says I'm debriding six nails. With Medicare guidelines, those nails have to be symptomatic, too. So it's really not that common to have a single patient with six mycotic symptomatic nails. What does symptomatic mean? They're causing symptoms to the patient. They hurt. They're secondarily infected. They're causing painful ambulation. That's not that common a patient to have six individual mycotic symptomatic nails. Typically we get two is pretty common, both big toes. Four is not that uncommon, both big toes and sometimes the little toes. Uh, but six is a little unusual. So if you're using 11721 a lot, I would go back and look at see if you're really doing that correctly, if that's really the code you should be using. Uh, you can combine 11720, which said I'm debriding at least one mycotic nail, and 11719 or 11 uh, GO127. You can combine those on that patient, but they're different diagnoses. You're using a dystrophic nail diagnosis for GO127 and 11719, using a mycotic nail diagnosis for uh, 11720, because that's paying you for up to five nails. Well, you still got five others that, that you're trimming and cutting. You can still get paid for those five, too. So you can combine 11720 and 11719 or 11720 and GO127. You cannot combine 11721 and one of the trimming codes because 11721 is paying you for 10 nails or 11 if they've got an extra toe or 12 or whatever. I've had that question before. Uh, questions with that because that's something we do a lot of typically. So basically the 721, you just can't combine it with anything. Yes. The question was if can you... you can you combine 11721 with any other nail codes? No. Unless I'm doing one of the next two codes. If I'm doing an avulsion or a matricectomy. I could get paid 11721 for six nails and do a matricectomy on a seventh nail. But you can't combine the 11721 with any of the trimming codes. Uh, so 11730, nail avulsion. This isn't a slant back on the side of the toe. This is numbing up the toe, taking out the side of the nail all the way back to the matrix, but not doing a matricectomy. Okay, that's a, that's a definition of a nail avulsion. It could be the entire nail, so it could be part of the nail or the entire nail. Okay, but you got to numb them up or give, put in the chart note why you didn't numb them. If they're totally neuropathic and you could take that nail off and they're not going to feel it, that's okay, but say something in the note on why you didn't use anesthesia. And, uh, You've taken that nail off. You've given them some type of instructions to follow up. 
So those are the three things you want to have in your chart note if you're doing that. This is the most audited code in nursing homes for podiatrists, 11730. 11750 is the same as 11730 except you're doing something to the matrix. You're killing that matrix somehow. Sharp blade, chemical, whatever, heat ablation, whatever you want to do to kill that matrix, but you're killing the matrix at the same time. So you wouldn't build 11730 and 11750 on the same nail. You don't build them on separate borders. We used to have a code that said matricectomy, additional border. We don't have that code now. It says partial or complete now. So that 11750 or 11730 is going to pay you for the entire nail, whether you're doing one border or two borders. And in the next lecture on modifiers, we'll tell you how to get paid for another toe if you're doing it with the appropriate modifier. Yes? Do we have to have pain for nail avulsion? Or? Do you have to have pain for nail avulsion? Uh, you should expect some type of secondary diagnosis. An uh, ingrown nail would be the typical primary diagnosis. But if they're neuropathic, you know. Exactly, if they're neuropathic. But there's probably, why are you taking that nail out then, is probably inflamed. There's probably some, maybe a cellulitis there, maybe a paronychia, maybe an inflammation. There's, there's another reason there why you're taking that nail out, just not ingrown. There should be some type of symptom there too. Even if they're neuropathic, they're still going to be red and swollen and... Other questions with the nail codes? Yes? So what would you use for a slam back? I mean, if you're really digging out and you're going to toenail, what would you use? You know, the question is, if you're, if you're doing a slant back on it, what's the proper way to code it? It's going to be one of two things. It's either going to be part of the E&M service you're providing to that patient on that day, or it's going to be non-covered service to the patient, okay. one or the other. Uh, skin lesions, again, going on with the kind of the, the I hate the phrase routine care, so let's change it to at-risk care we're doing for these patients. Uh, 11055, 5657, what's the difference in those? The only difference is the number of lesions you're actually debriding. Okay. So 55 five says 1, 56 says 2 to 4, and 57 uh, says 5 or more. So if you've got a patient that has got three, uh, they've got a, a distal clavi on the second toe and an HD on the fifth toe bilateral. That's three lesions. You're trimming those lesions. That's 11056. And then we'll talk about the proper modifiers for those in the next lecture. Questions with that? The, generally, these are going to be hyperkeratotic lesions for us. Not always, but typically. Uh, 17110 is destruction of skin lesions. Typically, you're going to use this if you're using any type of destructive chemical agent. Uh, you're using canthrone, you're using sal acid, you're using trichloroacetic acid, uh, 5-FU, uh, whatever destructive agent you're going to use, that's the proper code for that destruction. And typically, even in dermatology, it's an attempt at a destruction. It doesn't mean that it's successful every time, so you may have to repeat that periodically, and that's fine. What kind of diagnoses would you use with that? Wart, uh, neoplasm, uncertain behavior of skin. Well, those are typical diagnosis codes for those lesions. Typically, um, especially Medicare, requires a secondary diagnosis to make it symptomatic. Uh, warts are covered for Medicare if they're symptomatic. If you've got a wart right here for, me for Medicare and there's no symptoms with it, it doesn't bleed, it's not painful, it's not covered. So a dermatologist takes that wart off, it's a non-covered service. <coughs> Same thing with the foot. But typically the warts we talk about in the foot are plantar and usually they're painful. So you need to put that secondary diagnosis, some type of symptom diagnosis. It's bleeding, it's infected, it's inflamed, it's painful, something like that. Okay, lesion excision. Typically we're talking about the warts or some type of, these are benign lesions. There's a series of malignant lesion excisions too. So we're talking about benign lesions here. Uh, how do you know whether it's malignant or benign? Pathology is going to tell you. So if you suspect that it's a malignant lesion, you better have a pathology report. You don't necessarily have to have one for a benign, but you should have one for a malignant lesion. Um, lesion excision, these are based on size. Location is irrelevant. This is, these are codes for anywhere in the body. They're strictly based on size. So if I'm doing one that's less than a half a centimeter, 0.6 to 1, 1.1 1 .1 to 2, 2.1 to 3. Most of ours are going to fall into that 
11,420, 11,421. Typically, we're not excising lesions. Usually, they're much bigger than one centimeter. Yes, sir. Okay, the, the, note, the question is, wh what's the size? It's the size of the lesion itself or the size that I took out? It's the size you took out. So it's the square centimeters of, the, of, the ins of what you took out. Uh, whether you're doing a, the three to one double ellipse or you're doing a circular, it do doesn't matter. Just kind of figure out how big that, that wound is that you left. This also includes closure of the wound. Now, you can make the decision in your own mind that I'm going to let this heal by secondary intention but you can't bill additionally to close the wound once you take that lesion out. That's included in the code. Okay. But if you decide not to close it, since it's included in the code, they're paying you to close it. If you decide not to, then you need to give a reason in the chart why I chose not to close this, this hole that I just made in this patient's foot. How about biopsy code? Uh, biopsy code, same thing. It includes closure if you do it. Uh, it's a separate code. I don't know if I included those in here. Uh, actually, we've got a lecture on biopsies later. Yeah, we've got a separate lecture on it. But it, the closure is included in the... Is it included in that? No, biopsy is separate than this. Incision and drainage. Uh, this is the second most audited code in nursing homes and probably the second most audited code after nail codes for podiatrists. Uh, incision and drainage, you've got t basically two codes you look at that imply infection, and that's 10060 uh, and 10061. What's the difference in those? The terminology says 10060 is simple or single. 10061 says complicated or multiple. So if I'm doing two incision and drainages, uh, if I've got one on each toe, one on each big toe, and I'm doing two separate ones, that's a single 10061. It's not a 1060 plus a 1060. It's a single 61 because that code says multiple. It doesn't say anywhere, but anywhere in the body. It could be anywhere. The dermatologist could do one here and one on an elbow. That's a single 10061. Uh, the toughest one we get into is what's the difference between sing, uh, multi, uh, simple and complicated? And that really comes down to your professional judgment on what the difference is. Uh, simple sounds pretty simple to me. I really didn't have to do much. It just poked a little hole and pus drained out and everything was fine. Complicated, I had to spend more time. I had to go deeper tissue. Uh, these, are sub these are skin, so you're looking at integumentary system. You're not going to muscle. They're different codes if you go to muscle. Uh, so I'm looking at uh, maybe depth, maybe size. All those things might make it more complicated than simple. But you have to justify that in your own mind, and you justify it in the, in the note that you're making for this patient, too. Uh, 11740, uh, IND subuglal hematoma, that one's pretty straightforward. Whether you drill a hole in the nail, whether you uh, use a hyphricator and melt the nail and let the, the blood come out, whether you numb it up and come in from the from the front of the nail and just make a little tunnel for the, however you want to do it, doesn't matter. If you're draining the subocal hematoma on any nail, that's the code to use. One code per toe. It includes the anesthesia and includes, uh, it's a 10 day global, so it includes a follow up within 10 days. That's the other thing too, matricectomies on Medicare patients. How many of you had Medicare patients heal a matricectomy in 10 days? I've been practicing 30 years. I think I've had it happen one time that they've healed a matricectomy in 10 days. Well, that's the global for a matricectomy is 10 days. So if I, if I see the patient at day 10 and they're still not healed and I want them to come back in another week or two to make sure that they heal this wound, that next visit is a billable service. Typically, it's going to be an E&M or maybe a... Um, could be a wound care code, but that's a billable service after that global. So keep that in mind. Teenagers heal in seven days. Medicare patients take longer. So do you have to have them come in within that 10 day to qualify for the next visit? Do you have to have them come in within 10 days to qualify for the next, that billable because service? You, my, my if you know that patient, I've seen them before, it's very recurring, do I really have to bring them back in with 10 because I know it's going to take three weeks? Okay. If you explain your medical necessity on why you chose to see them at 
14 days or 17 days instead of 10 days. You have a, a reasoning in the chart why I'm doing this. Then, and, and I've audited a lot of charts, so has Jeff. Uh, I, would, I would allow that as an auditor. If there's a medical necessity, a medical explanation as to why you're not seeing them in that global period. Medical necessity should well, rule everything. Uh, and m medical necessity would, should rule everything. Uh, musculoskeletal injections. Uh, and actually, these are, these are backwards. Uh, 5 1 and 5 0 are, are reversed. I apologize for that. Uh, 5 0 is, is the body of the tendon, and 5 1 is the insertion. Uh, so, 5 0 is your injection for plantar fascia. I see a lot of people try to build plantar fascia injections as uh, 10060. There's no joint there, so it's not a joint injection. They'll say, well, there's a bursa there, and that code says bursa 2, but really 5-0 is the best code for a plantar fascial injection, whether it's at the insertion or whether it's in, in the, uh, if you're doing injecting a plantar fibroma. 5-1 uh, is insertion. Again, I apologize for those being flipped. Uh, 600 is a small joint. 605 is intermediate joint. What's the first, coming from the toes, going up? Let's do it the easy way. What's the first large joint you get to, coming from the toes, going proximally? What's the first large joint? Okay, let's look at the, from the tip of the toe to the shoulder, what's the first large joint? Tip of the finger to the shoulder, what's the first large joint? Yeah. Elbow. Same thing in the foot. The first large joint you get to from coming from the toe up is the knee. So unless you're in Georgia, Florida, or other places, you're never going to use uh, 620610 unless you're injecting a knee or hip. So what's the first intermediate joint we get to? It's the ankle. You may, may put, you know, you say subtalar joint might be an uh, intermediate joint, and I can, I can argue that, that you, I could probably give you that. Uh, but mid-tarsal joint, anything distal mid-tarsal joint, including mid-tarsal joint, is a small joint. And what doesn't make sense to me is it's technically harder to put a needle in a smaller joint than a bigger joint, so why do you get paid more for a hip injection than you do a big toe injection? It makes no sense. <laughs> and we've argued that point uh, at the RUC numerous times every time these codes come up. Uh, so 600 for anything distal to the mid-tarsal joint, uh, 605, small or intermediate, and then uh, ankle is 605 also. There is a code for ultrasound injection. Mm -hmm. There's six in that. Correct. Did we use it in conjunction? All right, there's, there's a code for uh, ultrasound injection of a joint, and they're based on small, medium, and intermediate, and large too. You don't build those two joints together. That code includes the injection and the ultrasound visualization. They don't be used to before that code came out. And actually, I was one of the people at CPT that got us that new code. Uh, it was you would build the ultrasound visualization and the separate joint injection. Yeah. Right. Uh, so we do have the, the and you've, I've got those two codes there, the 604 and the 606, the ultrasound guidance injections. So that includes the injection and the visual visualization. Uh, 612, aspirate ganglion, doesn't matter where it is, if you think it's a ganglion cyst or, or a mucoid cyst or something like that, and you're going to aspirate it, that's the code to use. Yes, sir? Just back up a little bit on the ultrasound guidance. If you're doing an intermediate joint with ultrasound guidance, you're not doing two separate codes, one for the ultrasound and one for the thing. Do you still need to have an ultrasound before? Yes. Okay. Question was, if I'm billing the uh, 20604, 20606 joint injection with ultrasound guidance, do I need an ultrasound report and a procedure report? And the answer is no. You can combine them into one report. But you need to have something in there that says, I visualized the joint with ultrasound using this amount of megahertz power like you'd have in your ultrasound report. But because you do two reports, you don't get two codes. Right. You don't get two codes. You just get, it, do one report, one code. Uh, nerve injection, 64450 is your typical nerve injection anywhere other than a, a Morton's neuroma. If you're doing a Morton's neuroma, 
It doesn't have to be third interspace. It can be anywhere. Uh, that's 64455 if you're injecting a steroid in there. If you're doing a sclerosing injection for a neuroma, that's 64632. And if you're doing a nerve destruction anywhere else, it's 64640. So if you're doing a tarsal tunnel injection, which code would you use? But steroid along the posterior tibial nerve, which code would you use? 64450 would be the code for a tarsal tunnel injection, dorsal intermediate cutaneous nerve injection, capsular nerve injection on the first metatarsal, uh, any name nerve that you can think of other than neuroma is uh, for steroid injection in the foot is going to be 64450. Okay. Any other questions with nerves? So if you're doing a sclerosing, it's 64632. If you're sclerosing or destroy, destroying any other nerves, it's 64640. Wound debridement, and we'll talk about wound debridement a little bit in more detail later, but initially you're looking at depth. Size matters to a degree. Depth matters on your initial choice of which code you're going to use. So if I'm debriding just skin, there's slough on the top, I'm taking that off. I'm not taking out any subcutaneous tissue at all. That's 97597. If I'm taking out subcutaneous tissue, in addition to anything above it, that's 11042 or 11045 based on size, and the size is 25 square centimeters. The first 25 square centimeters, you build 11042. For each additional 25 square centimeters, centimeters you build 11045, one code for each additional 25. If the wound is more than 100 square centimeters, which I'll say is unusual in the foot and ankle, it's possible. I had one this week was like 90, so it was pushing it. There's a separate code for 100 square centimeters. So you wouldn't build these, you'd just build a 100 square centimeter code. And then each additional 100 square centimeters. Those are designed for backs and burns and things like that. Uh, so if I'm doing subcutaneous tissue, again, it includes the skin above it and the subcutaneous tissue. I bill 11042 for the first 25 square centimeters, 11045 for each additional 25 square centimeters. 11043 is I'm doing, I'm debriding muscle. If I look at it and I clean out everything and I see the muscle and tendon, but I'm not debriding muscle and tendon, then I use the subcutaneous code. If I'm debriding muscle or tendon, then I use the 11043 and includes everything above it because you can't get there. Can't get to the muscle or tendon if you don't go through everything else, right? So it's not debriding. The question was if I'm cross hatching, you've got that escar on the posterior heel. No, no, not escar. You're actually the, the fiber this, tissue. This talks this these codes talk about excision of tissue from the wound. So if you're not excising it out, then you're not debriding the wound. I understand the philosophy, and it's good treatment on some wounds, but it's, it's not, doesn't fall under these categories. Uh, 11043, muscle, tendon, and then 11044 is bone. Okay, so if I'm debriding bone, not bone sticking up out of the wound once I'm finished, but I'm actually taking out some of the bone. Uh, bone has a 10 day global, the others have zero day globals. Yes? So a few weeks ago, I had a huge medial foot and ankle wound. Debris did it down, medial myeloma is, is exposed cut part of that bone out and submitted it to pathology. So I would build a 11044 and mm -hmm. then 11047 even, so the wound, most of the wound, there's only a very small part that was bone debris. Okay. The question is I've got a wound that has varying depths of tissue penetration. Correct. Okay. So I would build 11, uh, you could build a biopsy of the bone too. Not necessarily a debride bone, because you really didn't debride bone, you just took a biopsy of it. That's what it sounds like. So you'd build a biopsy of the bone, and then the other codes based on the tissue depth. Uh, so you build the deepest tissue of that wound, but in that situation, it sounds like you really just did a biopsy of the bone, you didn't debride the bone. That makes sense? Casting strapping, uh, 28580 is a Unaboot. 
and on your notes it has XXX there for the next one, uh, 28581, so write that code in for those X's. That's multi-layer compression dressing. Whether that's in a kit that you buy from a company with multiple layers in there or you do your own, you put uh, something on the skin and then you put another layer of compression and then another layer of compression on there, that's a multi-layer compression dressing. So if you traditionally do an Uniboot and you put web roll on top of it and you put Coban on top of that, that's a multi-layer compression dressing. If you just put the Uniboot on and send them out, that's an Uniboot. But you need to describe exactly what you're using for each layer and that you're putting it on to give compression to the wound. So you would expect some type of a diagnosis in there of some type of <coughs> swelling, edema, inflammation, something. Otherwise, why are you using compression? Uh, 29425, BK cast application. If you're putting a cast on, there are Q codes that are Hixpix codes to describe the materials you're using. And it says uh, plaster for a below knee walking cast, fiberglass for below knee walking cast. So build those codes too, because you get paid for the materials as well as the cast application. So build those materials each time you put it on. There's only one unit of those materials though. Even though you say, well, I used four rolls of fiberglass, that's still one unit of the Q code. And in 29425, foot ankle strapping. Uh, this is your typical plantar fascial low die strap. You're doing a, a J strap for perineal tendonitis. You're using a high die strap for Achilles tendonitis. Any of those would fall under this code. There's another code for toe strapping too that I didn't put on there. Yes, ma'am. We're going we're gonna to have a lecture on, on that will come up later. But what, what was the last part of the question? Yes. Uh, imaging, the typical imaging studies we're going to do in the office, 73600, two views to the ankle, uh, 610, complete ankle. That means you're doing at least three views. You may decide you want a fourth view. That's fine. It's still complete. Same thing with the foot. If you decide you want a fourth, you want a medial, you want a dorsal planner, a lateral, a medial oblique, and a lateral oblique of the foot, the same foot. That's a complete. Got to be at least three views for complete, but more views uh, would be the same thing. Now, if I'm doing four views, and I do this frequently, uh, I've got ankle issues and foot issues, and I'm getting four views of the right foot. I want two of the ankle and two or three of the foot. You can bill separately for the ankle and the foot. So you could bill um, for a mortise and an oblique of the ankle and two views of the ankle and then a DP, a lateral oblique and a lateral of the foot. So I'd have a complete of the foot and two views of the ankle. From a technical standpoint you can get the foot and the ankle on the same view, so on a lateral. So I, I, as an auditor, I kind of look at that one and say, I'm going to give you one lateral. But the other views are independent. Uh, so that's the four x-ray views. And then six, uh, 76881, ultrasound complete. 76882, ultrasound limited. What's the difference between complete and limited? Limited is a particular structure. I'm looking at the plantar fascia. Complete is I'm looking at a joint and describing all the, the structures around that joint. It doesn't mean complete from toe to, to knee. It means complete for that structure you're looking at. Would so it be if, complete if you have an image before you inject and another image after you inject? Would it give, be complete if I did a pre-injection image and a post-injection image? Uh, medical necessity would be the first question. And the second is it's it would determine on what structure I was looking at. If I'm looking at all the structures around the ankle and I'm injecting the ankle, uh, then I've got the steroid injection code with the ankle that gets, has ultrasound guidance, so that would take us out of that. Uh, but if I'm looking at the, you know, what would be your net medical necessity of doing the post-injection for, say, plantar fascia? That's not a medical necessity. That's a, that's a convenience to the patient, but not a medical necessity. Yeah. You should know that during the injection, because you're using the ultrasound during the injection. 
Um, so, but the main difference here, take home message is complete means a joint with all the structures, you're describing all the structures around the joint. Uh, limited means you're looking at one particular structure. You get one of those codes per foot. <coughs> surgical codes. You know, a lot of these others fall into surgical codes. The nail debridement are surgical codes. But now I'm talking about typically intraoperative codes. Uh, you've got a variety of tenotomies, soft tissue codes that you can look at. IND below fascia. So if we looked at the incision and drainage, that 10061, that was multiple or complete or complicated, that was subcutaneous tissue. That was skin tissue. Now we're going down low. So we're going below the fascia. You've got an infection that go, penetrates below the plantar fascia, and you've got to open up the plantar fascia to get to the drain the, that you'd use this code. 28010, tenotomy simple. 28011, tenotomy multiple. What's the difference in that one? You're cutting more than one tendon. It's not additional toe or additional area. You're cutting more than one tendon. So if I'm doing a tenotomy uh, to release a, a flexible hammer toe and I cut both the flexor and the brevis, that's an 11. That's a multiple tendons that I've cut at that toe. Uh, 28060, plantar fasciotomy, doesn't matter if you're doing a, there is a code for EPF now, but it doesn't matter if you're doing uh, an instep, if you're doing a proximal, a distal, wherever you're cutting the plantar fascia. There's a separate code for plantar fasciectomy. So if you're taking a piece of the plantar fascia out, you're removing a plantar fibroma, you'd use that code. That's not a plantar fasciotomy, that's a plantar fasciectomy. Doesn't matter how much of it you're taking out. So there's two separate codes there. And then 28080, uh, neuroma excision. Doesn't matter which interspace you're in. If you're doing a neuroma, it could be a neuroma that's not in an interspace too. And you use that for the neuroma excision. Uh, metatarsal osteotomy, lesser metatarsal osteotomy, failing gel osteotomy. Those are codes, if you're not doing a bunion at, with it, at the, you're not come, if I'm doing a bunionectomy with an osteotomy, I wouldn't use this osteotomy code. That's included in the code for the bunionectomy with osteotomy. We've got a bunion lecture coming up a little, little later today. 28122, metatarsal osteotomy. Uh, failing geal, uh, excuse me, ostectomy, failing geal ostectomy and excision. What's the difference between an ostectomy and an excision? But look at the code you're, you're looking at specifically. Uh, if I'm just taking a little Taylor's bunion off of the fifth met, that's an ostectomy. If I'm taking out the fifth met, that's an excision, fifth met head. So look at the code, the terminology in the code specifically, uh, and that'll help you guide you whether you're doing an ostectomy or an excision. Uh, surgical codes 28270, 28285. Um, I was one of the editors of CPT Assistant, which is an AMA publication that addresses coding controversies. And I, I, on the panel, I said, look, well, if we do a 28285 hammer toe repair, got a hammer toe and I do a hammer toe repair, okay? That's hammer toe repair. Toe straight, everything's fine. If I've got a hammer toe and I do a hammer toe repair, I've still got a contracted joint. I've got to go back and do a 28270 at the metatarsal flanger joint to let that toe come down, okay? Just a hammer toe, do a hammer toe repair, fine. I've got this kind of hammer toe, do a hammer toe repair, toe sticking straight up, I've got to bring it down. That 28270 is not included in the 28285. When I did that example with my finger, they said, yeah, that's right. So since that article was published in 2012, you should be able to build a 28285 and a 28270 on the same ray at the same time if you've got that situation. Not every 28285 has to have a 28270 with it. You've got to have that contracted metatarsal flanger joint. We don't always have those with hammer toes. So if you've got them, you can bill separately for them. Uh, you need different diagnoses. You need a hammer toe diagnosis for the 28285. You need a contracted joint diagnosis for the 28270. That's included. It's included in the hammer toe. Tendon lengthen is included in the hammer toe. If you're lengthening extensive. I would, that would be part of the 28270. 
Separate incision makes no difference anymore. It used to, it doesn't make any difference anymore. Uh, 2829 colectomy, that's taking off the bumps of the first metatarsal phalangeal joint. It includes both sides of the joint, metatarsal and phalangeal side. You're cleaning all that down. 28291 is a colectomy with a metatarsal phalangeal joint implant. Okay, so that's doing a colectomy. We're basically, you're cleaning it off, taking part of the base, putting either a hemi or a total implant in there. Bunion codes, we'll talk about bunion codes in detail a little later, but basically you've got bunion with the osteotomy. Uh, without osteotomy, that's your, your McBride silver. Uh, you're not going to see the words McBride, Austin, Base Wedge, Mitchell, Reverdin, Longershino, what am I leaving out? Crescentic. Uh, you're not going to see those proprietary names, Chevron. You're not going to see those names in the CPT book anymore. And that's something CPT is doing. They're getting away from, away from name procedures and going to description of the procedure. So bunionectomy, bunionectomy without, a metatars without an osteotomy, that includes a Keller. Uh, 2295 is bunionectomy with a proximal osteotomy. 286 is bunionectomy with a distal osteotomy. Uh, 297, bunionectomy with the first metatarsal cuneiform joint fusion, that's your lapidus. 298, bunionectomy with the phalangeal osteotomy. Okay, so I've talked about no osteotomy, implant, colectomy only, uh, distal osteotomy, proximal osteotomy, fusion. So what's left? Bunionectomy with double osteotomy. If I did a double osteotomy, meaning I did a proximal and a distal metatarsal osteotomy, I did a proximal metatarsal osteotomy and a phalangeal osteotomy, I did two phalangeal osteotomies, that's 28299. So the question we usually get is what about a scarf? What's a scarf? Is that a distal or a proximal osteotomy? Well, in your hands it may be proximal, in my hands it may be distal. So pick one. But it's one osteotomy, it's not a double osteotomy. An Austin is not a double osteotomy. Well, I made two cuts. That's two osteotomies. That's one osteotomy uh, trying to achieve one goal. Okay. I did two osteotomies on my base wedge. I took a wedge out of there. That's two cuts. That's double osteotomy. That's one osteotomy. Scarf is an osteotomy, one osteotomy in three different planes. Double cut Austin, double osteotomy. Nope, one osteotomy. Fusion and an osteotomy, okay? Uh, I did, and I'm doing, a, taking a bump off the bunion too? Okay, where am I doing my osteotomy? Okay, so I did a lapidus austin, okay? Uh, Bill the lapidus as a fusion of the first metatarsal cuneiform joint and a bunionectomy, 28296, the distal bunionectomy. It's not two osteotomies because I'm not making osteotomy at the fusion. I'm doing a fusion. Even though you say, well, I'll cut the bone, but... Hypermobile joint or something like that. Yeah, different diagnosis. Your HAV diagnosis would be for the, for the Austin. And then use a hypermobile joint, uh, arthritic first metatarsal cuneiform joint, something like that. But different, different diagnoses. Uh, amputations. There's an amputation for basically every level of the foot. I didn't include entire foot on there. But there's one for entire foot, too. So if I'm doing a show pot, uh, 28800, transmet, 28805, amputation metatarsal with a toe. So you're taking the entire ray. Okay, so I'm taking, the enti I'm taking from the end of the big toe to the cuneiform joint, taking the entire ray. Okay, that would, or I'm taking the second, second toe, entire ray, fifth toe, entire ray. That would be amputation metatarsal with toe. What about if I'm doing the next one? Amputation metatarsal flangeal joint. Take off the big toe, and the head of the metatarsal has got some necrotic crap in it, and it looks osteomyelitic too, but the mid shaft looks pretty good. MRI said mid shaft looked fine. That's not amputation with toe and metatarsal, that's metatarsal flangeal joint amputation with a resection of the distal aspect of the first metatarsal. So it's two separate codes there. And that was in CPT assistant last month, I think. Um, 
IPJ, doesn't matter which IPJ, it just says IPJ. So if you're doing a uh, distal interphalangeal joint amputation or proximal <coughs> interphalangeal amputation, it doesn't matter. It's still an IPJ amputation. And multiple toes? You could bill it for multiple toes, yeah. 13160, secondary closure wound. If I did that metatarsal phalangeal joint amputation and it had a lot of pus in it, I'm going to leave it open and let it drain for a couple of days and then come back and close it secondarily. That's the code to use for it. That, that is a high paying code too. Does it have to be dictated as a stage procedure each minute? You would use it as a stage code. And we'll talk about stage modifier in a few minutes. But yeah, you would say I, I'm planning to leave this open because the, the amputation code includes closure. So I'm planning to leave this open. I'm going to come back in a few days. The patient does well. You may come back in a few days and do another, do a debridement and then come back a week later and do the closure. So you could possibly have another procedure in there. But they would all have the 58 stage modifier procedure uh, modifier on them. Does that have to be done in the hospital or often for the follow-up? Uh, place of service. Jeff, I'm going to def place a service on those. If I do the metatarsal flanger joint amputation, I'm going to let it stay open for a few days and drain. We do this all the time. We kick questions off each other. I'm going to let it stay open for a few days and drain. And they get discharged, and I see them in the office, and I close it in the office. It, so for purpose of the video, the, the question was, you do an amputation, you leave it open purposefully, and then a, two weeks later in your office, you close it. If you, you, and, and can you do that in the office? If the modifier to close it was 58 staged, the place of service doesn't matter. If the modifier was 78 unplanned return to the operating or procedure room, the place of service does matter. We're going to do those modifiers in the next talk. What he, what he said. Yeah. yeah. Like I said, and the patient got discharged. They're healthy. Everything's fine. The wound's well, and it looking good. On who the person was that discharged. Yeah. Might not be you. Oh. Yeah. In our state, it's not. Yeah. Uh, and then somebody asked about the wound vac closure. Yes, you can do the wound vac at the time you do the debridement. We. Uh, yeah, you can, you can build that wound vac application each time using that stage modifier. Mm -hmm. Using the stage modifier. Because there's work involved in putting that wound vac on each time. More work than you probably get paid for it. Uh, the uh, ostectomy codes are in that 28110 range, repair and reconstruction codes. Just look, figure out what structure I'm looking at. And with the Coding Resource Center, it's easy. You just type in the structure, repair, Achilles tendon and the codes will pop up. So this, the structure depends on, that you're repairing or reconstructing, depends on which code you're going to use. The fracture dislocations. If a patient comes in and they have a fifth metatarsal fracture, on that initial visit, you have an option. You can bill this as just an E&M, knowing that I'm going to see them in a couple of weeks and take serial x-rays till this, this fracture's healed. I'm not, don't, I don't have to reduce it. Everything looks fine. You can bill that as an E&M, or you can bill it as a fracture care code. There's fracture care codes that say uh, fracture care without manipulation, fracture care with closed manipulation, fracture care with open manipulation, fracture care with open reduction internal fixation. Uh, so there's lots of different type of fracture care codes based on what structure is fractured, whether it's a metatarsal, whether it's a uh, tarsal bone, whether it's wherever it is, phalanx, whatever. So you have the option. You don't have to bill it as a fracture care code, or you can bill it as a fracture care code. Uh, so you kind of have to make that decision up front, though, as to which way I'm going to go. If you're going to open reduce it, yeah, you're going to bill it as a fracture care code. But the closed, especially those closed without manipulation, you have the option to how to bill that. Now, if I've got crush injury, Drop a, I'm in the gym, I drop a weight on my foot and break the three central metatarsals. They're all broken. They're not displaced. I don't have to reduce them. Is that one fracture care code or three fracture care codes? This was published in CPT Assistant, I think, in January. Close fracture, no manipulation, three, fra three metatarsals broken. Is that one or three fracture care codes? How many say one? 
let me say three. CPT Assistant Editorial Board, APMA, and American Foot Orth uh, Orthopedic Foot and Ankle Association all agree it's one fracture care code. There's no additional work. There's no additional work for you, so it's one code. Now, if you're manipulating them, you could do three. If you're mani manipulating all three, you could do three separate. But typically, they don't need manipulation. They include anesthesia. If you manip mi yeah. manipulate them, yes, it does include anesthesia. All these codes include anesthesia. Just keep in your mind, any code that's likely going to hurt your mother if you do this procedure on your mother includes anesthesia. <laughs> or in our situation, daughter. You and I may be a little older than the rest in the room, so if we do it on our daughter, it's going to require anesthesia. Uh, and then the arthrodesis codes, depending which joint you're fusing, would depend which arthrodesis code you use. Hicks-Bix You have a dislocation and a fracture of the same kind, pick one. Pick, pick one or the other. And which one would you pick? Which one's going to pay you more? Which one has a higher RVU is the one that you pick. Hicks Picks codes, uh, you got diabetic shoes or Hicks Picks codes with inserts. Wound care supplies, if you're dispensing wound care supplies from your office, uh, they, they're, they fall under DME or Hicks Picks codes. Injectables, if you're doing that steroid injection with ultrasound guidance in a joint, you get one code for the injection and the ultrasound guidance, but you need to build the injectable too. You can't build the lidocaine or the marcaine. You can't build the anesthetic, but you can build, if you're putting the steroid you're putting there, you build those with the J codes. There's a J code for each type of steroid, Kenalog, Celestone, Dexamethasone, whatever, and they're based on the number of milligrams you're using. So one unit of Dexamethasone is four milligrams. If you're injecting two cc's of dexamethasone, that would be eight milligrams, you're going to build two units. One unit of Kenalog, there, there's Kenalog 10 and Kenalog 40. If you're injecting 40 milligrams, one cc of Kenalog 40, that's four units of Kenalog 10. Four times 10 is 40. Okay? So keep that in mind, too. You may be shortchanging. They don't pay a lot, but if you do a lot of injections over a period of a year, that's you know, hundreds of dollars you're leaving on the table if you're not billing the injections correctly, dejectables correctly. Patient information, tracking codes are in Hicks Picks too. Uh, that's just data collection. DME, cam boot, ankle braces, orthotics, uh, AFOs, anything like that, those are all Hicks Picks codes. And they're easily findable uh, in your references to, to find those codes as to what applies to the specific thing that you're doing. AMA refer IPMA reference materials, again, we talk about Coding Resource Center. Um, we're not selling the Coding Resource Center. We're not trying to sell the Coding Resource Center. We're trying to let you know where your references are. If you prefer to buy three books from NGINX, then you can buy three books from NGINX and, and spend time looking them up. Uh, if you find some other online coding re resource that you like, fine. If you want to spend $800 for AMA's online coding resource center, go ahead. Uh, the, but it's, a, it's something that's out there that we've developed as, as uh, that members can use. The seminars like this one, the webinars, live or recorded, and then the APMA website. Uh, we have a lot of young physicians in the audience. Uh, we encourage people to talk to younger people to try to get them in, in interested in podiatry. Uh, if you get somebody, kind of, you know, 12-year-old kid comes in the office and what do you want to do when you grow up? And they say, well, I want to be a doctor. Well, talk about him to podiatry. This is my daughter at age eight looking at my foot. Uh, and we'll show you a picture of her in the next lecture. So questions? Okay. What was the second part? 11721, finding the right diagnosis for? Okay, with med typically with Medicare? Okay. Within the Coding Resource Center, what state are you in? Indiana. Okay. You can go to Indiana, Medicare, look at Indiana, and it'll give you the, the requirements for okay, so those codes in, in by your carrier, Indiana. Okay. And those, those are different because my carrier in North Carolina may require something different than yours. Okay. And there, there's a thing called... Um, I don't know where to look that up. Yeah. Yeah, it's in, it's in the Coding Resource Center. 
Uh, the, there are things called national carry determinations, NCDs, which should be overall reaching for the entire country, and then there are LCDs, local carry determinations. And most will have for wound care products, for wound care services, for at-risk care, uh, and a variety of other things. They'll have local determinations that you have to meet those. You said there were two questions. And, and my carrier in North Carolina doesn't allow the, the diabetic, the at-risk codes are irrelevant for 11720, 11721. They want mycotic nail and symptoms. Some states say, if they're at risk, then we'll pay for this. So it just varies from state to state. I think it's just changed. Yep. All right. Other questions on CPT, ICD-10, uh, XPix, things like that, before we get to modifiers.